This video will be a minute or two longer than average because there are two themes which should be united and which each require a little explanation. A few videos ago, the theme was the implications of Article 61. Those discussed were basically implications for the community in general. But how do their effects reach into our lives as individuals? The viewers of this video will find themselves presented with some moral challenges which they may not have anticipated. But we would not be fulfilling our lawful duties were we to shun them or pretend that they don't exist. When talking of the law and our interactions with it, we must first, as usual, define our terms. People often nominate rules, acts of parliament, mandates, directives, etc. as laws. But that is a very loose and inadequate definition, and in most cases, seriously inaccurate. Vaccine and mask mandates, for example, or lockdown proclamations may emanate from government ministers or even bureaucrats, but they are not valid laws, even under the defunct Australian Constitution, and cannot be enforced if people have even the will, never mind the wit, to resist. However, many people fell for the illusion of legality never got close to understanding the true relationship between these directives and what is lawful and have suffered grievously as a result. The word law is here defined as a condition or set of conditions which is binding upon everyone without exception. Such laws exist in nature from which the concept is derived. Easy examples are the laws of gravity and other laws of physics. If one is driving a car at 150 kilometers an hour down a straight road and decides to take a hard 90 degree turn in either direction, the car will not obey our will, but will continue in its former direction only it would now be rolling or cartwheeling rather than on its four wheels. The law of angular momentum permits no descent. We've spoken of common law, which derives from the same empirical principles. If people wish to live in a harmonious and just society, they must respect each other's rights and liberties as well as their own. If enough people depart from that, the society will suffer damage, just as would the cartwheeling car. Naturally, the amount of damage will be greater the more people depart from the law. When Magna Carta was sealed in 1215, it was in response to some very serious crimes being committed by the Crown. And while some may argue that it was done under duress and therefore lacks validity, that is easily countered by remembering that the nobles were the peers of King John and Runnymede was effectively a common law court where he was tried by his peers, found wanting and told that if he wanted to retain his position, he would have to be subject to the same laws as everyone else. With Article 61 inserted as a self-defined security clause. In today's terms, we might regard it as a suspended sentence, since it applies to everyone who occupies the role of monarch. Having touched on some social implications, what are the implications of Article 61 for us as individuals? We need to consider our own relationship with the law. With law, there is no neutral ground. If someone asks us, 
what we think of laws prohibiting theft, assault, fraud and murder, etc. It is not an option to say that we are ambivalent about them and don't much mind either way. Either we support such laws and choose to obey them, or we take the view that such things ought to be allowed if we can get away with them. That is the attitude taken by criminals and, unfortunately, our governments, which have repeatedly broken their own laws for many decades now, especially in the last two years. They have been aided in this by deliberately withholding vital information about the laws and their validity from the public. The information has been available, but if people either can't or more seriously won't access it, it's arguable that they get what they deserve. As one philosopher put it, a society of sheep inevitably begets a government of wolves. However, we need to delve further into this and sometimes what we unearth can make us uncomfortable. Our feelings though are there to tell us when something is wrong and bring our attention to focus on how to fix the problem. There is a hierarchy of offences under the law, including the common law. We have misdemeanours and felonies, for example. The intent involved in a crime or offence has a great bearing on the outcome. That is why manslaughter is a lesser charge than murder. One carries acceptance that the death was unintentional, maybe even accidental while the other involves either deliberate intent or even planning beforehand. But the most serious crime on the books is treason, much more serious than even murder, because it involves, with malice aforethought, the death of a nation, with all the rights of individual citizens at risk Sadly, all too often, treason causes numerous literal deaths of citizens. It is for these reasons that treason still carries the death penalty, despite attempts which are themselves treasonous to repeal the relevant law, which was the 1795 Treasonable and Seditious Practices Act. We are expected to report crime being committed to the relevant authorities when we witness or have knowledge of it. The reason is that if this isn't done, the crime may go unpunished, redress or justice will not occur, and society becomes more lawless and less safe for honest people than it was before. If we don't do this, we may justly be charged with complicity. It isn't something we do because we feel good or it makes us think that we are morally superior to our errant fellows or our neighbours. It is done because it is our duty. And why is it our duty? It's our duty because the rights and freedoms we have were fought for and secured by our forebears many of whom sacrificed their lives that we might live free. The freedoms we enjoy are not ours to carelessly cast away by indolence or cowardice. We have a joint responsibility with our constitutional partners, the barons and the monarch, to preserve these freedoms and rights for succeeding generations. If we see treason being committed, it is no different from any other crime. In fact, it is arguably far worse for the reasons already given. Our duty is to report the crimes to the police or any other authorities who are charged 
with these responsibilities and to hold them to account if they fail to act in their oaths or are complicit themselves. And if they refuse to honour their oaths, it is our clearly spelt out duty under Article 61 to distress the Crown and its agents until they do start to uphold the Constitution. This is done primarily by refusing to fund any unlawful activities of the Crown or its agents, such as revenue raising fines or fees, etc. It is also clearly spelt out that it is our duty to broadcast knowledge of these crimes of treason as widely as possible and to urge our fellow citizens to join with us in resisting this gross evil. It is for everyone to thoughtfully consider these implications and what they mean. If these thoughts make us uncomfortable, that is as it should be. I would go so far as to say that no one should feel relaxed or indifferent about failing to join in this resistance to tyranny. No one should feel that it is too much trouble to fill in a few forms or post off a few notices to corrupt officials to protect the rights and freedoms of their children and grandchildren. No violent action is required, indeed it is forbidden. But we are lawfully bound to unite to resist attempts to destroy our country and bring to justice those who seek to perpetrate this greatest of crimes. Failure or refusal to do this is literally to aid and abet treason, just as failure or refusal to report a theft child abuse or a murder to which we are witness or of which we have definite knowledge is to become complicit in those crimes. To those who have not previously considered these implications of the law as it applies to them, the message is to do so without delay. In another earlier video I spoke about the forthcoming election and my conclusions may not have sat well with some people because I counselled against voting in an illegitimate election to try to elect a corrupt parliament. It is arguable that the best possible action for the population to take, given that there won't be time to get anywhere near enough people under Article 61 by May the 21st is a wholesale refusal to participate in direct defiance of the unlawful act which attempts to make voting compulsory in this country. An election where less than half the people turn out to vote can hardly be interpreted as a ringing endorsement of the legitimacy of whichever combination of MPs take their seats. There is also the question of the growing suspicion that the election might be subject to tampering, with people being removed involuntarily from the electoral rolls and other irregularities which may be covered more fully in future videos before the election. To expand on that reasoning, I add that it doesn't matter who sits in the next parliament. That parliament will have no more lawful authority than the existing one. And besides, to a person standing under Article 61, it matters not what acts or rules are issued from that body because they will be invalid and simply do not have to be obeyed. Indeed, under the true law as it now stands, we are all duty bound to get into standing under Article 61 and refuse to obey all invalid acts or statutes. Groups are forming to facilitate these efforts. 
And we urge those seeking to fulfill their duty to make contact through this email address, mc1215a61 perth at gmail.com. Thank you.